With the captivating splendor of Doksu Palace forming its heart, Jongdong's historical significance is extraordinary and stands today dually as an enduring testament to a rich, if ultimately tragic, dynastic legacy and as a living celebration of contemporary Korea's dynamic national character and lush, thriving culture. Indeed, one might say, Jongdong is at the very epicenter of cosmopolitan soul. When King Hojong returned from the Russian legation in 1897, he moved to Gyeongun Palace, or what is today known as Doksu Palace, which he perceived to be the safest place he could possibly be, as the palace complex was surrounded by Western legations with whom he might find a safe haven in the event of an emergency. For over two centuries, however, it had been used primarily only as an auxiliary residence. Until 1897, when Gotong reinstated it as the formal seat of royal power, and shortly thereafter, as the formal seat of imperial power. The power shift in East Asia and the overwhelming trend towards modernization and globalization sweeping across the world prompted King Gotong to make a drastic decision. <laughs> to transform his kingdom into an empire and make himself emperor. This decision made partly to place Korea on equal footing with the sudden explosion of global powers and partly to stave off the encroachment of Japan, was ironically fully endorsed by Japan, who also perceived this move correctly as a way for Bojong to showcase his country's independence from the Chinese Empire, which had for so long held the so-called Hermit Kingdom in thrall. <laughs> Thus, Yang later renamed Doksu Palace, in 1897 became the heart of the short-lived Daehan Empire. Unfortunately, Hojong's reign as an emperor wouldn't last long. Following the triumph of Japan over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, Japan browbeat Hojong's officials, though apparently not Hojong himself, into signing the Ursa Treaty at Jungnyeonjung, which was then a building house within Doksugun. This effectively made the Taehan Empire a protectorate property of the Japanese Empire and all but stripped away its diplomatic sovereignty, which laid the crucial foundation Japan would need to undertake its more extreme colonial annexation of Korea in 1910. Jungnanjung is also significant as the site where Emperor Bojong made one last desperate maneuver to spare his country the coming yoke of colonial subjugation. He deployed a team of three secret emissaries to The Hague to publicly denounce the Ulsa Treaty as invalid and even illegal. Unfortunately, these emissaries were denied entrance into the proceedings, and for his trouble, Kozong was forced in 1907 by Japan to abdicate his throne in favor of his son, Sun Jong. After his abdication, Kozong would remain at Doksu Palace until his death. Though during the colonial period, the Japanese opened the complex to the public as a park. This is the only palace in Seoul where you actually you can stand at one point and you can see all the buildings. And why is that, you ask? Well, 
There are no walls, have you noticed? Why aren't there any walls? Because the Japanese tore them down during their colonization of Korea. Oh no, that's terrible. Today, Doksukung, standing as one of the five great palaces of Seoul, is an incredibly popular tourist attraction as well as the epicenter of a thriving cultural and artistic community. All manner of art galleries and exhibitions are showcased both within and immediately outside of the palace complex, currently at the National Museum of Art, housed in the previously mentioned Sokju John Hall. There's even a photo exhibition of the Imperial family. And just beyond Doldamkil or Doksu Palace Wall, built in the 1920s, is the Seoul Museum of Art, where even as we speak, there's a Tim Burton showcase opening to the public for viewing. Seoul Square was the spot Kojan selected to hold his coronation as emperor in 1897. And not too far from there, at the present West End Chosan Hotel, he made his very first offering at the Altar of Heaven, which prior to his installation as emperor had been the exclusive privilege of the Chinese emperor. Later, at the height of the independence movement at the end of the 19th century, Seoul Square hosted a gathering of many people in what was known as the People's Assembly, an event unprecedented at that point in Korean history. Today it continues its legacy as a gathering spot on a mass scale. In 2002, thousands of Red Cup Koreans packed into the square to cheer on their team at the World Cup, and later that same year to hold a candlelight vigil to commemorate and protest the death of two middle school girls. Just one month ago, Koreans and foreigners alike filled the droves to Seoul Square to watch international sensation Psy perform live in a concert. Some 80,000, 90,000 people crammed into the square and spilled into the streets at one of the largest outdoor concerts in the world. It's frequently the location that politician hopefuls choose to rally their supporters, making Seoul Square the epicenter of a community of citizens deeply invested and actively involved in the promulgation of a uniquely Korean national ethos. As you walk in Jongdong, you will not only encounter the historical epicenter of the Taehan Empire, but also a vast variety of contemporary art. Quirkiness has its place everywhere in Seoul, but it can especially be seen in Jongdong, the epicenter of eccentricity. Even though Jongdong is not known for any particular dish, they specialize in making any dish exceptionally exquisite, be it mandu, guksu, or sojebi. And Jongdong can thus be seen as an epicenter of great gastronomy.